Okay, hello. I've got the slides ready for today. I've got one or two things I want to mention first. Uh, one is that when I did office hours this morning, one of the students was on from China and pointed out that they can't regularly get to things like Google Meet. So we might start doing uh, some of the office hours with Zoom. And also if you need to post a Zoom link instead of a Meet link, that's fine. Uh, all the staff should have it installed or installed soon. So we're going to let them know that. On the reminder side here in the slides, we've got the reminder that Project 1 is due on September 22nd by midnight. And we don't want to fail people. We want you to succeed. But we are going to point out every once in a while that when things are due and that you remind you to be making progress. Now in project one, there's some tips in here. Excuse me, I've got a cat who's pawing at me, telling me, of course, he needs attention right now. And I already showed cat a couple times ago. Okay, so you say your code's running too slow. What should you do about it? Well, first, most important thing is make sure that you're compiling with dash 03. And our make file that we gave you does that by default. Um, if you're inside of him, this isn't in the slide, if you're, oh, he, he's going to show himself. Spencer, don't get up there. Anyway, uh, if you're inside of an IDE, like Visual Studio, Xcode, Visual Studio Code, they will be in a debug mode by default. And so they will tend to be slower when you're inside of the IDE than if you were at the command line and using our make file and doing dash 03. So some of them, some IDEs are really simple, like Visual Studio, it's right there on the home page. There's a little uh, pull down that says debug in it. And you open it up and the next thing down there is release. And there's a way to do it in Xcode. I think it's on the pro uh, product scheme page. So really, if you want to check for speed, do it outside of the IDE is what I usually do. The IDE is what I want for debugging, like why do I get the wrong output? Why do I, why do I get a seg fault on this? Um, when you're looking at making changes to code and do they speed it up, you don't always have to submit to the auto grader to know if it was faster. What you can do is time your code before you compile go to the command prompt, use your old version, run it with the time command, which we're going to show you how to do that. Run it with the time command and then make your changes, run it with the time command again and see if it sped up. And you want to do this on like the biggest input that we give you. And that'll give you a better feel for uh, whether or not it has speeded up. Oh, it looks like I didn't realize this. It looks like when I modified the slide total to get the measuring performance and analysis that sort of uh, moved over the top of the slides. Okay, whoops. Oh, great. Now it doesn't look right at all. That's even worse. I don't know what the heck is over the top of that. So when I edited the slides to put the title of the slides in there, it ended up getting a little bit wider than it normally is. Okay, I'm just going to shrink that down a little bit. And we'll, okay, that looks better. Okay, so you don't always have to use a submit to see if it's faster. You can test the code by yourself. Um, look at the project one, the STL and U slides. And one of the biggest ones in there is the sync with standard IO false. And that one, just one line of code, can make a huge difference in speed. The backslash n instead of endl. <clears throat> and I don't remember if the full explanation, I think it is, it's in the Project 1 STLNU, it explains why these do make things faster. And also using the right data structures. So Linked list is almost never the answer for 281. You want to use something like a vector and a deck. And pay attention to these in every project that you do. 
we had a student once when they got to project three, they couldn't figure out why it was slow. And it took me a while to find that while they had used sync with standard IO false in projects one and two, they forgot it on project three. So the other thing is, um, and there's a, there's a no on this slide, don't worry about these. I would say the very first one be careful of. Make sure that functions that get called many, many times are either in the same CPP file or implemented in a header file. But things like virtual functions, you probably don't need those yet anyway. Um, the third one, they're using a 1D vector instead of 3D. That's for a different version of project one. So there's these things are sometimes less important than others. So the thing to do also is use some different tools. So there's a tool called perf that we're going to show you how to use in lab. There's um, on the auto grader, uh, you can First of all, make sure you're doing module load GCC 6.2.0. And you can double check that with G++ minus minus version. And there's a space in there. It may be a little bit hard to see. So G++ space minus minus version will tell you if you're using version 6.2.0. And that's critical for project one. If you're using the old like 4.83, I think is the default compiler on Kane, that compiler string processing is way slower in that version of G++. So make sure you're using the current version. And our make file builds with the current compiler by default, but you've got to do the module load so that you can run it on Kane. And there's an example here of a calling. This is, again, this is a different project. Uh, one that we had where it was a, a, sh a spaceship and a 3D um, map that you had to get out of the detention level and and find the hangar where your uh, where your ship was so that you could escape from the detention level on the space station and your your robot helper would do, run the program for you. So the command line options and the file names might be different, but you still get the idea of the of the basic part of the perf command. And hey, we got to change the next name of the executable. That would be letter underscore debug. And that gets you a perf report, which then you issue a new command, perf report, and it shows you stuff and you can open up things and see how much time is spent in each of the different functions. And this one was uh, created a while ago when James Jewett was teaching with me and he added a couple slides in here. So what about memory? Well, the Valgrind, Valgrind does lots of things. Valgrind tells you about segmentation faults. Valgrind tells you about things like using uninitialized variables, which is really, really critical. I've seen people who they say, this runs perfectly. Everything runs perfectly on my computer and nothing runs on the autograder. And I say, did you run it on Kane? No. Did you run it with Valgrind? No. Okay, run it with Valgrind. Oh, wow, I've got uninitialized variables. Uninitialized variables may be on your computer, they're false, and maybe on the autograder and on Kane, they're true. But Valgrind will tell you if you use an uninitialized variable. There's also another tool with Valgrind called Massif. And a Massif is a geological feature. It's like a, like a large, like a large land mass. And so Massif tries to produce a graph of your code, like how much memory was used at each point. And so this can give you an idea of where you're using the most memory. Now, it's hard for us to look at your perf or your massif and see what the problem is, because we don't know for your organization of the data what the right numbers should be. But what you want to look for is, like in the perf report, what takes the most time? If I change this in the code and I rerun it, does that part take less time? You know, so. For example, let's say reading my complex dictionary takes 40% of my runtime, and I make some changes, and then reading a complex dictionary only takes 20%. I would call that a good change. And you can also do that with the time command, which we're going to show you in a minute, is run the whole program. And if your change makes the whole program run faster, it was a good change. 
but I can't look at your perf output or your massive output and point to what's wrong. I have to know the entire structure of your code for that report to be meaningful. So this is, these are meant as a tool for you to use, like from one version of your code to the next, did you make it better? So here's an example of some massive output that James Jewett ran on his ship program, and it shows how much memory is used. And then it also, you can open it up and it'll show you like uh, what was being used by where, and we'll see on the next one. So it shows you like, this is the main data that was being used. That's like the, the input file right there. And then what are these other peaks over here? Those other peaks are like the deck growing. This different project one still had the data you read from the file and the data while you do searching and the queue grows and shrinks. So that's what these, these peaks afterward were. Now he made a mistake in his program on purpose and then opened it up and looked at it and said, hey, I've got 21 megabytes worth of data. I've got three copies of this 21 megabyte vector. And now he ran this. Notice he's only got memory addresses here. If he had done this on a debug version, he would have gotten line numbers over here also. And that's a much more useful. So if you're going over memory, what do you do? Look at, first of all, the big things. The dictionary is the biggest thing. The deck is going to be the second biggest thing. Don't start worrying about Oh, should I have stored that one variable in a size T or a uint 32T? One variable, not a big deal. But you could say, hey, I put a size T inside of my dictionary. There might be 100,000 of those. I should worry about that thing that there's 100,000 copies of. Maybe I should make that size T into a smaller integer. And this brings up another thing someone mentioned in office hours today. They said the project spec says that you can't assume anything about the size of the dictionary. That's not entirely true. You can assume the size of the dictionary is less than 2 billion words. So that gives you the ability to use things like uint32 underscore t or int32 underscore t. This is a 32-bit or 4-byte integer. And so, so a range of, of, of uh, the unassigned gives you 0 to 4 billion. The signed integer gives you negative 2 billion to positive 2 billion. Either way, no trouble. I like the unsigned because it produces less uh, compiler warnings about like mixing signed and unsigned. Like if you do something like uh, this, you can say like 4 uint 32t i equals zero, i is less than dictionary dot size. So if I wanted to run through my dictionary, I could write a for loop. This will not give you a compiler warning. If you write int here, it'll give you a compiler warning saying, hey, you've got a signed variable that you're comparing to an unsigned variable. That could go way over, that could produce problems. So. Don't use int there. That's where uint32t comes in handy. Okay. Oh, shoot. I wrote over this whole thing. Okay. Well, let's erase that stuff. We got it on the video. Okay. Wait a minute. All of a sudden, my menu inside of PowerPoint doesn't work. I can't erase anything. I can't undo anything. Okay, well, I've never had that happen before. Okay, I'm going to have to be careful in the future on the slides. Okay, so it says, given the results from Massif, what is more important? The data read in, the total size of the data that you read in, the backtracing information, the data in the stack, queue, or better yet, the deck. And also, you could temporarily, don't leave it in there permanently, temporarily put in something that says, hey, I'll print out the size of the dictionary. Just what is the dictionary dot size? Don't leave it in there when you submit to the auto grader because then it would be wrong, but you could put it in there temporarily. 
Okay. Uh, I'm going over memory, and I already went over this one. You know, don't worry about single variables, how big they are. Worry about the objects and, and the things that there are many copies of that thing, like what goes in the dictionary, what goes in the search container. That's what you want to worry the most about the size of. Okay, so complexity. We're going to go back to complexity and talk about a bunch of things today with complexity. So with the function here, we did this one last time, and I went through and did the calculations uh, similar to our other for loop slide, and I got, you know, 6n plus 5, which is O of n. Now, really, this is what we're interested in. We're not going to ask you to give us this formula on the exams because it's too easy to just be off by one because I disagree about whether plus equals is one operation or two operations. So we're, we're really looking for the big O notation and we want the tightest possible big O. We don't, we don't want to just say n to the nth power because it's got to be an upper limit. We want a tight upper limit. We want to put some effort into calculating it. Okay, so we can measure complexity theoretically, analytically. We can look at, we can analyze the algorithm or we can analyze the code and we can get that big O or big theta notation for the complexity. And we can base that on recurrence relationships. We're going to talk more about those coming up real soon. Uh, another way to do it, which is what we're going to mostly talk about today, is empirically, meaning based on data. So we can measure our program's runtime within the program. We can measure our program's runtime using some external tools, and we can try it with a variety of inputs of different sizes. And when all you're caring about is, hey, small ones are fine, big inputs are too slow, you should be testing it with the big inputs. And that's why we give you larger inputs on uh, Canvas as part of the sample inputs and outputs, is so that you've got some bigger files to test things with. So programmatically, so putting it in the code uh, can be useful, but it also varies according to the language. Even in C and C++, there's a couple of ways to do it. So we've got some code here that was actually written by Amir Kamil from 280, and it, it was just nicely laid out, so we, we just copied that to show it to you. So we've got this class timer that Amir wrote, and we can see class timer's got a few things built into it. It's got this private, remember, hey, if this is a class, if I don't say otherwise, members of a class are private. So the member variables there are private. I left out the word private, why? To fit it on one slide. So I got uh, some private member variables, which is basically it looks like the current time and the elapsed time. So that's what cur and elap mean is current time and elapsed time. And then it says, hey, the constructor says initialize the current time, initialize the elapsed time to zero. Start the time says set the current time equal to now. So that's what start the timer means is set the current time equal to the time when they say start the timer. And then elap says, or sorry, stop. The stop member function says add to the elapsed timer. Remember, this is the same as saying elap plus, or sorry, elap equals elap plus. I started to write plus equals because that's my standard way to write things. So the uh, so that's equivalent to saying elapsed equals elapsed plus the, and then what do we add to it? We add the subtraction of now minus the start time. Reset sets the elapsed time back to zero and double seconds says, hey, return me that elapsed count as if it was a double variable. Okay, so now one thing we've got to note up here is be careful about checking the time too often. You know, if I'm taking an exam and I and I write it a little bit, I go, ooh, an hour and eighty min or an hour and forty-eight minutes left, right? An hour and forty-seven an hour and 47, an hour and 46. If I keep looking up at the clock every minute, I'm gonna spend a lot of my time looking at the clock. That's sort of wasted time. So if we're going to do this inside of our program, we don't wanna stop and start that timer too often. 
like I wouldn't stop and start the timer inside of a loop because then I'm doing extra work to look at the time all over and over again. So here we said, hey, let's start the timer, let's call some function, stop the timer, and then print out how much time it took to do stuff one. And that's what the one colon there means is stuff one or do stuff one. I was a little bit cramped to fit this all on one slide. So then we reset the timer. So reset the timer, remember, says no time has elapsed. Then I start the timer, I do stuff two, stop the timer, and then print out how long it took to call the do stuff two function. And that's the nice thing about doing it within the program is I can give an idea like, hey, this could be project one. Maybe do stuff one was reading the dictionary, do stuff two was searching. Maybe I could add another reset, start, do stuff three would be like producing the output, stop the timer, print it. And then I could get an idea of how long each section of my program took. So that's one reason that we might put it within the code is so that we can get a time for this section and a time for that section. Now we're going to look at other things that we can do and I'm going to have to switch my input over here to my terminal and I've got this. So what we've got is we've got a file. We've got a shortcut name for the file and if you're in a terminal here, what it says is there's a command called wget on Kane. If you're on your Mac or your PC, you might have to install this. So I'm just going to do it on Kane. So then you give it the web address and you say where to put it. This is dash capital O. So that dash capital O says put it in the output file search.cpp. Okay. So let me make sure I've got this ready. Okay. I got to switch my stream over to that. Okay. So you should be able to see my bash shell on Kane now. Okay, so I've got the wget command already there, and I'll just hit enter. And it says, basically, I, I went to this server, I connected, I awaited response, I got a response from that file, and then I've got my output, 3.7 kilobytes. That's what that's saying, 3.7 kilobytes, and I saved it to a file named search.cpp. And so if I do an ls-l here, we see, hey, oh, wait a minute, not just 33.7K, 30, 3831 is the number of bytes in that file. And the make file, I put this here ahead of time. I cheated a little bit. I put the make file here ahead of time, a copy of our make file, and I already prepared it. I put the, the identifier, ignore that, I just copied it from somewhere else. But then I said, hey, the name of the executable is called search. The name of my project file, notice I commented this one out because it, uh, actually I could have left that alone. It would have worked. No, yeah, it would have worked just fine because the thing named executable.cpp would have caught it. But I put it down here. I just uncommented this line and said, hey, I'll just give you the exact name, search.cpp. So if we go back to the command prompt here, I can type make, and it says I compile the cpp file into a .o, and then I linked the .o into an executable name search. Okay, well, let's see what it can do. Search. Okay, it says you must specify B or L for the type of search and the number of items on the command line. Okay, so B or L for the type of search. Hey, that sounds like binary search or linear search. Okay, let's try that. So search linearly in, let's say, 10,000 items. Okay, that did not take very much time to fill the vector, and it took some amount of time. It said, I found 54 out of 100 items. Basically, what it's doing is it's filling a vector with numbers, and then it's searching for, ran, uh, searching for numbers, and it's set up to find about half of them. It should succeed around half of the time, and it did. So it basically it fills the vector with 10,000 items and does a bunch of searches and then tells us how many succeeded and how long it took. Well, let's rerun that and let's make it bigger. All right, so making it bigger, it took longer to fill the vector, that makes sense. And in fact, it looks like it took about 10 times longer to fill the vector and it took 
a little over 10 times longer to do the search. Okay, let's make it bigger. All right, now we're getting up there. Uh, it took about 10 times longer to fill it. Took a little over 10 times longer to do the search. Okay, let's see if we can make another, put another zero in there. Okay, took time to fill the vector, about 10 times longer. And it took like more than 10 times longer, like, I don't know, like 12, 13, 13, 14 times longer to do the searching. Okay, but it's still about a factor of 10. Let's try some binary searches. Let's go back to the beginning, 10,000. Let's do a binary search. Okay, uh, small time to fill it and small time to search it. Okay, let's go up in the size. Okay, it took about 10 times longer to fill it and it took over 10 times longer to search it. Wait a minute. If this is a binary search, it shouldn't be taking 10 times longer to search it when the vector gets 10 times bigger. It should be mm, log base 10. If log base 2 of 10 is about 3. It should take at most like 3 times longer when we make it 10 times bigger. Well, let's look at the code. Okay, so there's, oops, I'm down at the bottom because it started there. Okay, so I put on my line numbers there so we can see that. Okay, so it's got the timer code, no big deal. That's, that's just exactly what we had in the slides. Uh, performs a linear, straightforward linear search through the input vector for the given value. Should theoretically have O of n complexity. Note, this code contains an intentional bug we'll discuss in lecture. Okay, we'll come back to that one because that one seemed to be okay. Uh, what about this one? Binary search. Performs a binary search through the input vector looking for the given value. Assumes the vector is in sorted order. Okay, yeah, it better be sorted order for this to work. Should theoretically have O of log n complexity. Note, this con code contains an intentional bug. We'll discuss in lecture. Okay, so let's bring this down so we can see. There's the whole binary search function. Okay, so it says... I'm going to give you a vector of integers, and I'm going to give you an integer value to search for. Okay, then we find it says low and high. This is basically an inclusive, low is the inclusive starting point, index 0. High is the inclusive ending point, which is the size of the vector minus 1. So that there were, say, 10,000 items, we should go from index 0 to index 9999. Nine, nine, nine. It's got to be in that range inclusive. Okay, that makes sense. While high is greater than or equal to low, find the midpoint. If that's the value, uh, oh, let's remember the value there. If that's the value we're looking for, return the index where we found it. Else if it's less than, move the high end. Else move the low end. And if we ever get out of the while loop, we return negative 1 to say, I didn't find it. Okay, this code looks like a binary search, and I can't see, well, I've got my bash window uh, involved, I can't quite see the uh, problem is, yep, I saw someone, someone saw it. So the problem is here, the vector is not being passed by reference, which means every time we call this, we end up making a copy of the vector. And that means this thing is theoretically log n. Yeah, the work inside of the function is log n, but just calling the function is O of n. So let's add a reference in here. Whoops. Let's add up here. Let's add a reference in there. And I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to put const over here because I don't need to modify the vector to look at it. Now let's go up to the linear search. And we'll look at the linear search. Oh, look, linear search says pass it by value. Okay, let's pass this by reference. Let's not put a const in there. Let's save this file and let's do a make. Ooh, problem. Okay, what does it say? Search.cpp line 106 binding a const vector to a reference discards the qualifiers. And that's in line 106. Let's go look at line 106. So 106 says, hey, let's call the linear search function and the target value. And if it was not equal to negative 1, we found it. Well, that line looks fine. But wait, let's go up a little further. This function test search says, hey, I'm going to accept 
this vector by reference, but I promise not to change it. Now your reaction might be, let's delete the word const here. No, get out of the habit of deleting the word const. The real problem is we made a promise. I'm not going to change it. We called someone. In fact, the binary search call was okay because binary search promised not to change it. We've got to go back to linear search and have linear search make the same promise. So let's go up to linear search, which was like around line 45 or something like that. Oh, pretty close. Okay, int linear search, const vector int reference vec. So it's the type of the variable is vector of int. We're going to pass this type of variable by reference, but we promise not to change it. Okay, let's save that out and we'll try doing make again. Okay, that worked. All right, now let's see if uh, dot search uh, linear. Let's I'm going to do linear to see if that got better, and then we'll do binary. So let's try like a hundred thousand, and then let's try a million. And notice this time the searching went up almost exactly by ten instead of like by twelve or thirteen. Let's go up bigger, and it went up. Okay, it took a little bit more than ten but better than it was before. What was it before? Let's scroll back. Uh, it was before it was around, let's see, linear was around 2.07, and now it's around, oh, wait. I guess I didn't do that size in there. It's hard to track that. Okay, anyway, so it got better there. Let's try a little bit bigger one, let's see if it can do it. Okay, so a third of a second to fill the vector and then about four seconds to do the searching. So it's going up by a little more than a factor of 10, but not too much. All right, let's try some binary searches now. Okay, so we'll try 100,000. Whoops, I forgot. I mistyped it. All right. Okay, so there's binary with that many. Oh, look at that. Now the time to fill the vector is almost the same, 0, 0, 0, 4, 4. 0, 0, 0, 4, 0, but look at the time. Now our search time is in scientific notation. The binary search is going so fast. Okay, let's up it by a factor of 10, still in scientific notation. Up it by a factor of 10 again, still in scientific notation. Okay, another factor of 10. Okay, there we go. It's, it's getting down to 0. 0.00013. Can we add another zero? Let's see what happens. Ooh, it worked, okay, and it went up. Notice it didn't go up by a factor of 10. It went from 0. 0.00013 to 0. 0.00021, basically. So that's doing a lot more like we would expect binary search to do. The size went up a lot, but the time didn't go up nearly as much as the size went up. And if we try to make this bigger, we were already at three seconds to fill it. If I go up again in size, two things will happen. It'll take 30 seconds to fill it, and we might go over the size of a uh, that we're allowed to make the array. So I'm going to go back to the slides for a second, and then we'll come back to this window in a minute. Okay, so I just want to make sure we go through everything the slides said we we're going to do. So we I didn't actually I didn't have to do the module load because it's already in my Bash profile. So if you don't want to type this module load command every time, what you can do is do this. Oh, shoot, I can't erase. So we'll see, we'll do the echo, echo, double quote, and then we'll do the module load. GCC slash 6.2.0, double quote, and then we'll say greater than, greater than, and on the same line, we say tilde slash dot bash underscore profile. And what that does is it says, echo says, take what I put in quote marks and send it to standard output. We say redirect that with appending. So if you already got a bash profile, we won't destroy it, we'll append to it. Add this command to the end of my home directory's bash profile. And what this means is next time you log in, this module load command will happen for you. And that's really what happened here is when I log into Kane, it always does the module load command automatically. 
Okay, so we did all those binary and linear searches. Uh, here's an example of using a profiling tool. I'm not going to do that now. Uh, this was one from uh, 280 Project 2 uh, image manipulation program, an example of what uh, the perf output and perf report looks like. Okay. Now, other things we can do, actually, there's other things I want to do. I'm going to go back to my bash prompt here. I want to show you one or two other things in here. And I want to make some mistakes, and I want to use Valgrind to help me out. So let's go into our source code file, and I'm going to go put some bad code in here. All right, so right here we've got uh, create a vector, which is an empty vector. And let's say I put in something here like uh, C out less than less than vec square brackets 10. Okay, let's put that code in there. So I write it, I do a make, I run the program, and I'm just going to go, I don't want to take it too long. Okay, segmentation fault. Okay, that wasn't very helpful. All right, how about if we just run valgrind with the same exact command? Okay, valgrind says invalid read of size 4 at this address in this file address blah is not stacked malloc or freed. Uh, wait a minute. That's not very useful. What does a memory address mean to me? What I need to do is make all, or I could type make debug, and aha, now I get search debug. What I'm going to do is I'm going to rerun, rerun my valgrind command with search underscore debug. Now, when it runs, it says search.cpp line 128 is the one that did something bad. What was the bad thing it did? It had an invalid read. So this stuff out here with the equals equals, this is saying this is my valgrind output. The number will change all the time. That's the process number that's running. So it's saying this process produced this valgrind output. If it had real output, the real output would be in here without the equals equals in front of it. So if the output from Valgrind has the equals equals, output from your program would be without the equals equals. So then it says, hey, here's the start of a new error. So there's, there's basically a blank line here. Then we say, hey, this is the start of a new error. Program was it terminated with a signal 11, sig seg v. And you will see sig seg v on the auto grader. It means segmentation fault. So it terminated the program after that error. Okay, let's go back to our program. Okay, so let's get rid of that line there. That was an invalid read. If I were to say, let's say I changed this line, and I said vec of 10 equals 10. Make all. Rerun my val grind. And now it says an invalid write of size 10. Invalid write because I tried to modify an invalid place in memory. Okay, so let's get rid of that line completely. Let's go make a different problem. Let's go down here to the bottom and replace this return zero with exit zero. Okay, so we're going to do a make all. We're going to rerun our valgrind command. Oh, I'm not going to up arrow. I'll teach you a new command, a new trick. Exclamation point, which we computer scientists will often refer to as bang, because bang is a lot easier to say than exclamation point. Bang v says reissue the most recent command that started with the letter v. That's my valgrind command. And look at this. After I type bang v, it'll put on the next line what command it really did run. Okay, so then it says here, filling the vector, uh, took this much time, I found this many items, searching took that much time, and why is the time so much longer? Because I'm in a debug build. It's not an optimized build anymore. This search debug was made with G3, not O3. So this is why it's taking way longer to run. In use at exit, 400,000 bytes. Aha! And it says it's still reachable. Still reachable is better than lost. It's still not good, but it's better. Still reachable, 400,000 bytes in one block. Rerun with leak check equals full. So what we're going to do is this time I'm going to up arrow because I want to modify this. And I'm going to add the leak check full, not to search debug. I'm going to add it 
after the val grind, but before which program to run. And I'm just going to copy and paste that because I don't want to type it. Oh, I've got to put a space in there. Okay, rerun it with leak check full to see details. Okay, so it says see details. It says, oh great, thanks a lot. Reachable blocks, those to which a pointer was found, are not shown. To see those, rerun it with leak check equals full and show leak kinds equals all. Okay, so let's put that in there. So I've already got show uh, leak check equals full. Let's add this one in there. I'll copy a space. And oh, it didn't copy the space. Oh, well. Okay. So now show leak kinds equals all. Let's rerun it. Okay. So now this is the, the error is so long that it's hard to see it. it. Scrolls over onto two lines in places. But let's look at the first line here. 400,000 bytes in one block, still reachable. Uh, operator new. Okay, now this, what it's showing me is the call stack. What was being called at the time the memory got allocated? Well, I don't care about some include file or something line 344. That ain't my code. Let's look down to things that look like me. Okay, vector.tcc, that's not me. Search.cpp, that's me. We want to go to the highest line in the call stack that is our code. Search.cpp line 128 says that's the problem. Okay, let's go look at line 128. Wait, line 128 is the reserve. That's the problem. That's who allocated the memory. It doesn't tell you who didn't deallocate it because it didn't get deallocated. It doesn't know who didn't do it. It just tells you where it got created that never got freed. And that's the problem with exit. Exit says, end my program right now. Don't run destructors, just halt the program, and that's why we don't want to do exit zero. Now, on the auto grader, you do have to do an exit one if something like the command line is invalid. We never check those for memory. So if it's in the errors you must check for, you should exit one, and we will never test those for memory leaks. We will never test your help option because we don't know what it should look like, so we never test your help. But the ones that should have output, so basically for project one, any test case that doesn't start with INV as the test case name is not invalid, therefore it's fair game for checking for memory leaks. Okay, where am I? I'm gonna go back to my sources. Okay, lecture mixed. Okay, so other things we can do. So we can measure runtime using the user bin time or just time. It doesn't matter which. So we can do bin user bin time or just time. And then we type basically our command line. Now, for example, if it was in our local directory, we would have to use dot slash. So I could do something like user bin time, this program and my options. So let's go back to bash one more time here. So I could do something like, so I gotta get, whoops, I gotta get out of my editor. So I could say time dot slash search linear a million, I think that is. Okay, so it does, there's my standard output from the program followed by this real time user time system time. Okay, let's go back to the slides and we'll talk about those. And then if we do time or user bin time, we might get slightly different formatted output, but it still has the same thing. It has the user time, the elapsed time. Uh, so this one's user, user, is a user, system, and elapsed. Real user and system, so they're in slightly different times, slightly different order. The uh, elapsed is the wall time, user is how much time you spent. Okay, so let's go back to the slides here. So, here's another example. I ran a program called DD. It's part of the Unix system. DD stands for disk dump. And I said, read from the input file dev0. Dev0 is an infinite source of zeros. You can read zero from it all day. OF, so I said output file is dev null. Dev null is what we refer to as the bit bucket. It is an infinite sink. 
you can throw as much data as you want into dev null and it all disappears. So this program would have run forever. I had to stop it with control C and then it tells me what happened with DD, what happened with disk dump, and then what happened with the time command. So we've got the user time, the system time, and the elapsed time, and the percent CPU. So what those numbers mean is the user time is how much time was spent by your code. How much time was your code using a CPU? The system time is how long the operating system spent doing things for you. The elapsed time is basically a stopwatch from when you started the program until it ended, how much wall time elapsed. And then the percent CPU is just the user plus system divided by the elapsed. Now the percent CPU, you would think, hey, wouldn't the time that I spent plus the time that the operating system spent doing things for me, shouldn't those add up to 100%? And the answer is no, because of how pro computers work. When the operating system starts running your program, your program does not run from start to finish and then stop. What happens is the operating system starts your program and it gives it control of a CPU and then it sends your program a signal which cannot be ignored and that signal says, stop, I'm taking that CPU back. You don't have it anymore. And then at some point later, it'll say, here's a CPU, start running again. What does it do between those two times? It does things like checking for other programs that need to use the CPU, like, hey, we, we got to run a virus check on this file that we're downloading, or we've got to stop that uh, someone that's trying to log into this computer remotely that doesn't have a correct password. So it, it starts and stops programs all the time. The operating system is doing this to your program, and your program really cannot see it. It doesn't, it cannot even be noticed by your program. Your program just looks like it started and then sometime later it finished. But really it's stopping and starting all the time in what's called a quanta. The quanta is how much time you get the CPU before it gets yanked away again. And then there's a pause before you're given another quanta. And the quanta is decided by the operating system. So that's why you don't generally see a percent CPU of 100. It's usually a little bit less than that. And the more things that are running at once, the lower that percentage might be. And the more um, cores on your CPU. So really, it's not giving you a CPU. It's giving you a core in the CPU. So if you've got like a six core machine, you it might get the quantum might refresh all the time. It says, start running, stop. Here, have another core. Wait, stop. Here, have another core. It might give you a different core. It might give you the same core. There might be pauses between when it's taken away and given back. It all depends on how many cores you have and how many other things you're doing with that computer. So uh, we already went through all of this, all the using Valgrind and stuff, but hey, it's good. We've got it in the uh, slides there. Now, if we look at empirical results, for example, we might sample a few pieces of data like size 5, size 10, size 15, size 20, and yeah, the times fluctuate a little bit. It doesn't matter whether you use the, the chrono timer object that we showed you or whether you use the time command. Running the same program with the same inputs multiple times in a row can have a slightly different amount of elapsed time due to these things of other processes and getting interrupted, etc. So you can have a little bit of different a measurement time every time you run the program with the same input. But you, from these four, you said, hey, I can draw a straight line through those four points. Looks like it's linear. But what if we test it with bigger sizes instead of beyond, like going beyond 20, I go up to 30, 35, 40, etc. Then maybe this region that, hey, this used to look linear for the first four, actually now maybe looks like oven squared. Maybe this is starting to look quadratic now. So we have to 
make sure that our input isn't so small that we can't actually see the trend. So we've got some prediction, we've got some analysis, some big O notation, and we've got our empirical or experimental results. What if they don't match? So what if my experiment gives me worse result than my prediction? So for instance, I got exponential when I expected linear. Or from today, what if I got linear when, I, when the analysis says it was log? What happens? Well, maybe I made an error in my complexity analysis. Maybe just my big O was wrong. Maybe I made a mistake in the code. So my algorithm really is log n, but my code is not because I say unintended operation, like I passed something by value that I could have passed by const reference. So if the experimental results are worse, you probably made an analysis in the coding, or you made an analysis, uh, made an error in the analysis, or made an error in the coding. What if my experimental results are better than what I predicted? Excuse me, I have to sneeze. Okay, luckily I got the mic off in time for that. Phew, it's apparently allergy season. Okay, what if my experimental results are better than I predicted? So for example, maybe I had the analysis wrong. So the analysis could go wrong either way. I could have had an experiment that didn't fit the worst case. So maybe my analysis did worst case, and maybe when I did my experiment, maybe I got lucky and got found stuff near the beginning of the array most of the time. So maybe I just got lucky and it wasn't really worst case. So uh, that's another possibility is that my experimental results weren't really random. They just happened to be close to best. Maybe I made an analysis in my measurements. So maybe when I did my measuring, maybe I only measured part of the program instead of the whole program. Maybe I didn't actually finish implementing the algorithm. Maybe I got so excited about having output that I forgot that I'm not quite done with the program yet. And the last one here is that maybe I implemented something better than I analyzed. So maybe I analyzed something and said, hey, I'll do a uh, bubble sort on this. And then when I was writing it, I was like, hey, I remember uh, I've got my 281 slides handy. I know I've got a log n sort, or, or sorry, an n log n sort. That's going to be better than n squared. Let's just go and do uh, a merge sort or a quick sort. And we're going to talk about those in a few weeks. So maybe I analyzed bubble sort, but then when I coded it, or maybe when I coded, I said, oh, that's right. I don't have to use uh, bubble sort. I can just call STL sort. I don't even have to write a sort at all. I'll just call STL sort. And that STL sort is better than the bubble sort I analyzed it with. Uh, what if my experimental results match, but it just takes too long to get the output? So I wrote a program that took once two weeks to produce output. And that was not useful. And so I looked at it and I saw I had made a mistake. I was throwing away results I could have uh, saved and I was recalculating things I could have saved. That's dynamic programming. We're going to come back to that. So I turned a two-week program into a one-day, like an overnight program. And then I rewrote the whole thing in a completely different way and then it took 30 seconds. So sometimes you have to rewrite the program. Sometimes it's as simple as, hey, I was running the biggest sample there is inside of Visual Studio, that's a debug build. I wasn't actually analyzing it with O3, I was analyzing it with a debug build. And also look for places that you can improve the constant factors. In terms of big O, n squared and 5n squared are the same big O, they're both big O of n squared, but I would expect like a 2n squared to run faster than 5n squared. And so improving those constants can make a big difference. So here's one I mentioned last time. We want to write the power function. We're going to make it simple. We're going to do only unsigned integer powers. 
So we're not going to do something to the negative 2. We're not going to do something to the uh, 0.35 power. We could take something to the 0 power, 1st power, 10th power, but we're not going to do any really complicated stuff. We can write this with loops. And we could write it with uh, n minus 1 multiplications. We could write it with n multiplications. We could do it with log also. And so we want to look at a couple different solutions to this. I'm sorry, I will be back in just a second. Now my nose is running after I sneezed. Okay, back. And I brought a Kleenex with me so we won't have a big delay next time if it happens. Okay, so we, I said write two solutions to this. Maybe you did since Tuesday or maybe you didn't. Or maybe you just looked at the slides which were already posted. Okay, so computing x to the n power. Here's one using a for loop. So I've got a simple check. It says if n is 0, just return 1. I'm done. I don't have to do any multiplication. I said, okay, if it wasn't to the 0th power, Let's take result equals x, and then I'll run a loop. This loop is going to run n minus 1 times. I'll do a multiplication. So I'll say result equals result times x. I could have also written this as result times equals x. Doesn't matter which way you write it. The compiler produces the same code. It's just a little shorter the second way. And then when we're done, we return result. So that works. It runs in O of n time. But we could also write it using recursion. So iterative functions like this one use loops. We could also write it recursively by calling itself. OK, so here's our iterative version. Um, this one, I made it a little bit shorter. I started out with no special if for 0. I started out saying the result is 1. And now this time my loop, my loop here is going to run n times through the loop instead of n minus 1. And that way I shortened the code. I didn't need the if in there. So that says when you're done, return result. So I start out with 1. If n was equal to 0, is 0 less than 0 is false, the loop never runs. Result stays 1 and we return 1. Okay, what about the recursive function? I've got, since it's recursive, it's got a base case. It says if n is equal to 0, return 1. So we got our base case. <clears throat> and then it says return x times recursive call. OK, what's the time complexity of these functions? First one's not too bad. We've got a big theta of n. There's a loop that runs n times pretty easy. For the second one, we're going to need a way to analyze a recursive function. OK, so what we're going to look at is a recurrence relationship. And we could write a recurrence relationship, one here, we could write a recurrence relationship for the computations. So I could say x to the nth power is equal to 1 when n is 0, or it's equal to x times recursive call when n is greater than 0. Well, I could also write a recurrence relationship for the amount of time taken. It says when it's a base case, when n is equal, equal to 0, the time is equal to c0, some constant amount of time. Then when n is greater than 0, it's the time to make the recursive call plus some constant amount of time. Now let's look back at this and let's see. I'm going to rewrite this equation here. So I said t of n is equal to, whoops, t of n is equal to curly braces, c0 when n is equal to 0. And it takes t of n minus 1 plus c1 when n is greater than 0. So what we want to do is we want to identify in the left half here who is c0. C0 is basically, let's make a list here. So C0 is basically lines 10 and 11. 
lines 10 and 11, the if statement and the return are what happens when n is equal to zero. All right, then what happens when n is greater than zero? What's in C1? Oops, apparently I'm a little close to the edge there. It doesn't run right. C1, okay. So in C1, we've got line 10 is part of C1. Then we've got the, after that, it's basically all of line 13. And line 13, so line 13 consists of a recursive, a uh, n minus 1, a recursive call to the power function, a multiplication, and a return. So that's basically what C1 is. C1 is the if at line 10, the n minus 1, the recursive call, the multiplication, and the return statement are all the things that go into C1. So that's what we mean by C1. And then, uh, or actually, no, sorry, C1 is not the recursive call. C1 is the t of n minus, uh, the t of n minus 1 is the recursive call. So the n minus 1, the multiplication, and the return are all parts of C1, and then the t of n minus 1 is the recursive portion. So C1 is the if, subtraction, multiplication, and the uh, return statement. So that's the work that happens, the non-recursive works that happens on a not the base case call. Okay, so how do we solve a recurrence relationship? You could look at CLRS and look at what they call the recursion tree method, which I think is harder. Um, what we're going to show you is how to do is the substitution method. So the substitution method says we're going to write out the equation t of n equals blah, 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 and then we're going to substitute into that, and we're going to look for a pattern, and then we're going to get a formula for it. So let's do an example here. So here's our recursive call. And now when I write out, when I said here, uh, write out the t of n in step one here, I mean write out the t of n just the recursive portion. I don't care about the base case right now. I'm trying to solve the hard part of it. So I say t of n is equal to t of n minus 1 plus c1. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to substitute in. And because my tablet is being, okay, I'm going to take a second here and restart my slideshow and see if I can get uh, my tablet to the point where I can actually edit the slides. And Oh, that's why I did. I forgot to save a copy. Save a copy on my iPad, save it here, replace it. That's why I couldn't do my editing properly. Oh, now it's messed up on the display. One more time. Okay, let's try one, two. I got to rotate this thing 90 degrees and back again. Okay, we're in business. Ah. Okay, here we go. So we got to rewrite this, but that's okay. So T of M is equal to T of N minus one plus C one. Okay, so there's our recurrence relationship. Now, when we substitute in, I'm going to make another copy of t of n to make it a little bit clearer. So what we want to do is we want to substitute in for this thing. Well, let's write it over here with just a different variable name. Let's say it was t of x. t of x is equal to t of x minus 1 plus c1. Okay. So when I substitute in, what I'm doing is I'm basically saying, hey, take this thing, plug it in here as, plug it into this formula, which means x is the same as n minus 1. So if x is the same as n minus 1, then t of n minus 1 is equal to t of n minus 1 minus 1, plus c1, which means t of n minus 1 is equal to t of n minus 2 plus c1. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to change colors. So this part here is, so that's equal to t of n minus 2 plus c1 
plus the original CY. See, that thing here just comes down. It's still part of it. Now, I still have T of n in terms of T of something smaller. I haven't finished yet, but let's do that same thing again. Let's replace this part. Okay, so we say that's equal to T of, well, if I plug, if I say X is equal to n minus 2, T of n minus 2 is equal to T of n minus 3 plus C1. But wait, I've got to bring down the purple C1, and I've got to bring down the red C1. Okay, I'm getting closer every time. I'm getting closer to what? A base case. If n keeps, if the t of something, t of n minus 3, t of n minus 4, t of n minus 57, as eventually that will get down to t of n. Eventually, if I do this enough times, I'll get down to t of n minus n plus c1 plus da da plus the orange c1 plus the purple c1 plus the red c1. Okay, now I'm going to go back to black here. Let's say, okay, so this is equal to t of 0 because t of n minus n is t of 0. That I know the answer to. Plus, I've got a bunch of C1s. Well, let's do two things. We've got to worry about how many C1s do we have and what is T0 equal to? Well, T of 0 is equal to C0 by definition up there. So T of 0 we know is equal to C0. How many C1s do we have? Well, I had to subtract, looks like I had to subtract about n times. Every time I subtracted 1, I got another c1. See, when I subtracted 1, I had 1 c1. When I subtracted 2, I had 2 c1s. If I subtract n, I must have n c1s. So this equation is equal to c1 times n plus c0. Hey, look at that. That's something I can get a big O or a big theta of. I could say this thing now I know is big theta of n. Because if I remove the lower order term, I get rid of a constant on the higher order term, and I've got my big O or big theta. So I've got the amount of time that this thing takes to run by doing the substitution over and over again until I get to a trend that I can recognize looks like a base case, proceeds to a base case, I should say. Now, we're going to do another example of this soon. Okay, so from our job interview question, remember, we wanted to do this with log multiplications. All right, so we want to do this with log multiplications. So here's one recursive solution. The left one is the one we just did. The right one is our new one. So let's look at what that one says. So it says if n is equal to 0, return 1. Okay, that's just our base case. That's easy. Then it says give me x to the power of n over 2. All right, let's put some numbers in here. Let's just try it with some numbers. Let's say I said give me 2 to the fifth power. That would mean x is equal to 2 and n is equal to 5. All right, so we say is n equal to 0? No, this isn't a base case. Okay, let's go to line 5. Line 5 says make a recursive call and calculate 2 to the 5 divided by 2 power is 2. Calculate 2 to the second power, 2 squared. So I make a recursive call for 2 squared. Okay, I'm in the recursive call. Is n equal to 0? No. So I'm in a recursive call. I'm going to change colors here. In a recursive call, and I've got to calculate, basically, uh, is it a base case? No. Then line 5 says, make a recursive call. Calculate me 2 to the first power. Okay. 
Make a recursive call. Is n equal to zero? No. Okay, make me a recursive call. Change colors again. Calculate me 2 to the 1 over 2, 2 to the 0th power. So it says to make a recursive call, calculate 2 to the 0. Is n equal to 0? Yes. Return 1. Okay, so we return 1. So this recursive call sends a 1 back there. So we're in the middle of that. So line 5 in the purple recursive call, uh, or in the red, sorry, in the red recursive call is the result is now 1. Then it says uh, multiply result by itself. Okay, so 1 times 1 is 1. And then it says if n is modulo 2, if n is odd. Well, n is not odd. Uh, uh, wait, n is odd. So n is odd, which is 1. So we've multiplied result times x, and we've got 2. So now we've got 2. So 2 to the first, so 2 to the first sends a 2 back to hey, we were trying to calculate 2 squared. So we calculated 2 to the first. Then we multiply result by result, which gives us 4. Then we say, is n odd? No, n right now is uh, 2, so that's not odd, so don't do that. Return the result. So we return result. We've got to go to black now. We return 4 gets returned up to this call. So in the original line 5, result is now equal to 4. Line 6 says multiply result times result, which is now 16. So, so far we've got result is equal to 16. But remember, this is our 2 to the 5th call. So then we say, is n odd? Hmm, yes, it is. 5 is an odd power. So let's multiply result times 2, which means the result is now 32. We return it, and we've calculated 2 to the 5th power. It's 32. So we broke it down. We said, hey, if I want to calculate 2 to the 5th, what I need is I need to calculate 2 squared. From 2 squared, I need 2 to the 1st. From 2 to the 1st, I need 2 to the 0. Now, it looks like we've done a lot of work here. But think about if we went to a bigger power. What if we, and I'm going to get rid of my markings here, what if we had originally asked for 2 to the 16th? If we asked for 2 to the 16th, we would say, well, divide that by 2. I need to calculate 2 to the 8th. Now I need to calculate 2 to the 4th, 2 squared, 2 to the 1st, which, return, uh, which re goes to 2 to the 0th, which returns 1. So now I really had to make about, looks like about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 calls instead of 16, 15 or 16 multiplications. I had to do 6 calls. One of them was the initial call. One was the base case, which didn't actually do any multiplication. So really, I did uh, 4 multiplications in there. There was the initial call and the base case. The other four calls did multiplications. I did four multiplications to get to the 16th. So that's how it works. Now let's look at the complexity of this. Now the complexity of this one would be a little bit of a pain because I've got this uh, different amount of work depending on whether n is even or odd. So I've got, this all, This is my base case. This always happens. This always happens. So the n divided by 2 always happens. The recursive call always happens. This always happens. The if always happens. And this line here, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. But that's a constant amount of work in the recursive call. So whether the constant amount of work re includes 5 operations or 6 operations, not a big deal. We'd only be off by a constant. So I don't want to analyze this. What if n is in recursive call where n is even? What if this is a recursive call where n is odd? I'll just say, hey, the recursive call is going to have to do a certain amount of work plus a constant amount of work, and the constant amount of work might be a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller depending on whether it's odd or even. Okay, so we got a recurrence relation for that. And I'm going to claim 
this is my recurrence relationship and I'm going to claim this is the complexity. So let's look at getting there. So we've got to have a little bit bigger T of n here. So we've got to have a base case. So the base case says when n is equal to zero, I've got some constant amount of work. That's my C zero is that lines two and three. Then if it's not a base case, I've got some C1, some constant amount of work. What's in C1? C1 is, let's change colors here. So C1 is the multiplication, the assignment, the multiplication, or sorry, the division. So it's the division, the assignment, the multiplication, the if. Those are always part of C1. Sometimes this multiplication is part of C1, sometimes it isn't. That's a constant amount of work. So either C1 has four parts or five parts. So C1 is equal to either four or five. I don't care which, it's constant. Plus, in the recursive case, we've got T of n over 2. T of n over 2. All right, so now we want to solve this recurrence relationship. we got to write it out. So let me get rid of my markings on here. And we'll start out in red. Okay, so T of n is equal to T of n over 2 plus C1. Now, let's write out over here on the right our T of x. T of x is equal to T of x divided by 2 plus C1. Okay, so now I want to substitute in for this part. When I substitute in for that part, x is equal to n over 2. So T of n over 2 is equal to T of x. x divided by 2, well, x is n over 2. So that's n over 2 over 2 plus c1. That's equal to t of n divided by 4 plus c1. So I've got t of n over 4 plus c1 plus the original red c1. And how do I know it's red and purple? Because I've used this tablet a lot. Otherwise, I might be saying blue or green or brown or who knows what. Okay, so we've got that much. Now, I want to substitute in for that portion. Well, okay, that's equal to t of n over, well, if t of n over 4 gets divided by 2, that's t of n over 8, plus a c1, plus the purple c1, plus the original red c1. Okay, so eventually I'm going to get down to the point where I've got a base case, right? I'm going to get down to the point where n gets divided by n, and if it divides, if I get down to n divided by n, the next one would be n divided by 2n, which would be 0. So I could get down to t of n divided by n, and then the next one after that would be t of 0, plus c1, plus a bunch of c1s, an orange c1, plus a purple c1, plus the original red c1. So I've got a base case, t of 0, plus a bunch of c1s. Well, how many c1s are there? Well, let's think about this. If my original n was a power of 2, let's say I started out at 16, I would get when uh, I would get a 16, 16 divided by 2 plus c1, then I'd get an 16 divided by 4 plus c1. So I, oops, I didn't show my hand. So I'd get 16 divided by 2 plus c1, 16 divided by 4 plus c1, 16 divided by 8 plus c1. 16 divided by 16 plus c1, and then I get t of 0. So I got four of those. So if, let's write this over here, just change colors here. So if, if n is equal to the k, I would have exactly 
k copies of c1. That's if they're exactly equal. Well, if they're not exactly equal, let's say n was close to 2 to the k, like what if n was 15? Well, it's not really 2 to the any power, but it's close to it. So if n is equal to 2 to the k, then I could say k is equal to the log base 2 of n. Well, that's if it's exactly a power of 2. If it's not exactly a power of 2, k might be equal to either the ceiling of log base 2 of n, or it might be, whoops, that was a bad ceiling. I sort of hooked the bottom of it. So it could be equal to the ceiling of that. Maybe it's equal to the floor of log base 2 of n. But it's approximately equal to the log base 2 of n. So I've got down here, this is equal to c1 times log base 2 of n plus c0. Well, let's say let's say that's approximately because it may not exactly be log two of n it might be the ceiling of log two might be the floor of log two but basically the log two is how many times i'm going to have to divide and then this tells me big theta of log base two of n i get rid of the lower order term get rid of the constant on the big term i'm left with log two of n so that's how we do the substitution method with a division same way, proceed downward, 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 get to a base case, look at how many of the non-recursive terms get added up. Now, what about binary search? Well, I'm going to claim that binary search has the same recurrence relationship. There's the place where I find it in the middle of the current region, and there's the place where I don't, and I have to make a recursive call into one of the halves of the array, and I've got a constant amount of work to figure out where the middle is, check if the middle is here, if it's less than or greater than, should I look left or right? And because it's the same recurrence relationship, we already solved this recurrence relationship. If this one's big theta of log n, this one's big theta of log n. This one I left out the base because we did last time. We saw that all log base complexities are the same. If you want to put a 2 in here, perfectly fine. Make it absolutely clear that it is a log base 2. It's not imperative, but it's nice to read. What if, though, we had a different problem? What if instead of two pieces, I cut it into three pieces? Would it come out to log base 3? Uh, what if I cut it into two pieces, but I have to process both? What if I cut it into four pieces, but threw one of them away and had to investigate the other three. So there's all kinds of strange things we could do here, and we don't, we don't want to have to redo this substitution method every time for a division. So what we're going to do is next time we're going to look at the master theorem, and we're going to see a shortcut for doing these recurrences, these meaning division. When there's division, we're going to use the master theorem instead. The substitution method works just fine, but... It's a little more work than I'd like to do when I can use the master theorem. So we're going to talk a little bit more about recursion today. Oh, wait, actually, we're running out of time. I just noticed that. So uh, let's see how we're doing on slides. we got a few more slides. And then we got, yeah, we got just a few more slides. OK, not too bad. So remember what tail recursion is. Tail recursion is when there's nothing pending after the recursive call, that the recursion ends and the function returns immediately. Tail recursion and iteration are equivalent. Now, here's, our, here's a version of factorial, and at the top, here's factorial. It is not tail recursive because after the recursive call ends, we still got a pending multiplication. I changed this one to tail recursive by creating a, what's called a default parameter. What that means is that I can call factorial, I can call like factorial of five. And if result is not passed in, if there's no result, it gets a default value of one. 
So I can say, print me out factorial of five. And what it does is it says, okay, is it a base case? No, then I've got to do, I'll do the multiplication before the recursion. I'll do the subtraction before the recursion. And then when the recursion is done, I can immediately return. Do I need the par default parameter to do this? No, I can make a helper function. I can have a starter function with one parameter, have it call a helper function that has two parameters, and I wouldn't need the default. But it's a way to get this one into tail recursive form. And we could do the um, time complexity. They're both O of n. We'd, we'd write the recurrence formula for this one. We'd solve it. Hey, we already solved this one. T of n, n is equal to T of n minus 1. Whoops, n minus 1 plus C1 gives us big theta of n. Uh, this one, tail recursive, is O of n but uses n stack frames. The tail recurses is O of n, but it only uses one stack frame. Binomial coefficient, we'll come back to this one later in the semester. Don't worry about this slide at all now. And then the rest of these slides are all pseudocode. We are going to show you pseudocode sometimes in slides. We will sometimes show you pseudocode on the exam and ask you the complexity. We will never ask you to write pseudocode. But in terms of reading it for the slides, I would look at the uh, last you know, 15, 20 slides, whatever is remaining in there, and just take a look over the format of the pseudocode, which, like I said, you'll see it in future lecture slides. Sometimes we'll do code, sometimes we'll do pseudocode. The problem with pseudocode is that it is pseudocorrect. There's no pseudocode compiler, so we don't. there's no way to verify that pseudocode is exactly right, except by implementing it and see if your implementation was able to be done without having to assume anything that someone forgot to mention in the pseudocode. Okay, so we're done for today. I'll close this off and head over to office hours.